It's... Ah, you have a church just uh, in front of your window. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, it's the 7, 7 p.m. Uh, ring yes. clock. Yes. Welcome to the first time harp dialogue. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, this kind of conversation and exchange uh, will help us and give us more motivation, more materials, more uh, ideas to um, survive this time, to create, to keep working, to keep moving, and to be just inspired by the harpists who are basically fighting all their life to give the harp the chance to make as much as they can for the art, for the music, for the harp. And uh, today with us is um, Isabel Ferrand. harpist of the world. She was studying, teaching, uh, working and playing in all possible countries on the all continents. And I think that is very important that we, we start our conversation together because uh, we are now facing the thing which is affecting all the world. So I am very happy to have you here with us, Isabel. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be, uh, uh, yes, trying this new way of communication uh, for the first time together with you. It's uh, an honor. The thing I got from your website, and I didn't know, you are admitted to the knighthood of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French Ministry of Culture. Yes. So can you just tell us which, um, which, Parts of your life were leading to to that. Well, I, I think actually the the big event that uh, put me into that situation is when in 2004 I organized the uh, European Harp Symposium in France, and uh, it was in Lyon. So it was like a mini World Harp Congress, and um, it had happened before in Amsterdam. It was Ernest Institute who started with that. And uh, it had been also after the Lyon one, it was already in Cardiff actually, uh, organized by Karel Thomas, who is organizing the World Harp Congress now. So we all know harp is a very small word and we have a lot of friends and um, harpists are very efficient and active. And uh, I think they are amazing people. And uh, we are a wonderful community and I'm so proud to be part of that community. Uh, the European uh, Symposium and the World Harp Congress, they are going one after another. Well, yes. Well, the, the European Harp Symposium was also uh, every three years. But the problem after, so in 2004, it was in France. In 2007, it was in, in Wales. And then uh, it stopped there, actually. So because the big difference uh, with the symposium, a European Symposium and the, the World Harp Congress is that the World Harp Congress, you have a whole board uh, in the back with people as uh, being on that board and that passing from every three years and every year in between we are working for not only the next congress but the one following and there is a budget there is an association with a lot of people from all over the world with the european symposium it was as i said started uh, in the netherlands with aniston too and every symposium is totally independent so they don't start with a small budget that is borrowed from a state head, if you can say like this. And then, so they are totally in charge to find their own budget, to organize everything. So, uh, but the budget is, of course, much less than for a World Harp Congress. So, uh, but it was very interesting because for me, it was the first time before I was 
a musician, I was a, a performer uh, and a teacher, but that was the first time I was on the other side as an organizer. And I learned so much uh, how it is to organize. And this, you know, very much also, Sasha, because you are organizing a lot of things. So uh, we see things very, very differently. And, um, and then we understand as a performer also how important it is for the organizers if we are really following up, sending the contracts when they ask, sending the bios, sending the pictures and everything. Because as an organizer, you rely so much on the performers. And some, of course, when we are performers, we are artists. So we are not so much thinking about the practical, uh, but it actually is also part of um, being a performer, is to also think a little bit about the practical because it's so important. Yes, that's that's all connected, and I think personally that the uh, modern musician uh, should be um, kind of uh, versatile, so they can really understand the world of music from the both sides. So when they prepare the repertoire, they already know how difficult it will be for organizers to work with their repertoire. So that that means that uh, you came through this uh, through the European Harp Symposium. You came now to the World Harp Congress. Harp Congress. So just to uh, to our public to understand that the World Harp Congress is a kind of a story because it's uh, organized in uh, 1981 mm -hmm. and it's uh, been through many countries. So it, it's it started in Netherlands and then it went to yes. Israel. Austria, France, Denmark, United States, Czech Republic, Switzerland, Ireland, Netherlands, Canada, Aus Australia, yes. and Hong Kong. Yes, so many, many continents also now, because at the, to start with, it was mainly in Europe, and then it went to, to uh, America, North America, and uh, in, first in, uh, in Washington State, uh, and then in Canada. So, and Finally, we went to Australia and to Asia, so we are opening to all continents. And then now we are coming back to Europe after many years uh, of being outside of Europe. So now we, we come to the most interesting, I mean, point because uh, I I didn't find any information if uh, the World Harp Congress was ever postponed. So no, this is the first time. And. Uh, how do you think it's it will affect? I mean, uh, can you tell a little bit of how the organi organizational process is working and how it's now affected by what we're facing right now? We are now in such a situation where it's so difficult for so many of us. It's, of course, difficult for the harpies and performers, but it's very difficult for also the harp makers, the, 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 all the... Um, uh, companies making harps because most of them, at least the one in Europe at the moment, I don't know how it's going with Lion Hill in Chicago if they had to close down the um, factory for the moment. But of course, Serli is closed in Italy, Camac is closed in France. So, I mean, the uh, the harp manufacturers they they cannot make instruments at the moment. So they would have been lacking instruments to come to the World Harp Congress anyway. So it would have been a very difficult situation for them. And then for all the harpies, you know, uh, we were thinking that a lot of harpies going to perform at the World Harp Congress. You know, they are freelance harpies and they they really rely on uh, their performances. Uh, to, to be able to, to own their own life uh, financially and support themselves. So this would have been a very difficult situation. Plus, we still don't know how things are going to be by the end of July. Like, for example, now in France, the French government has decided that all festivals are going to be either cancelled or postponed until middle of July. And the World Hub Congress was just a week after. So we might have been in a situation anyway where we had, we would have had to cancel. So it was much better to take the decision early enough that it was still possible not to pay fee for canceling the 
especially the um, venues where we would have been, and then be still able to get new dates for next year before everything was booked already. So this is why the new dates for 2021 are slightly later. They are in August now, to the, from the 6th to the 12th of August, just because of that reason, because for example, the college, uh, the Royal College, where the, most of the events should happen uh, in Cardiff, was not available in July at the same date, so we had to wait until August. But I think this is the best solution that could have been taken. And what the Welsh and UK team uh, are trying now to do is to just copy paste somehow uh, the program from 2020 to 2021. Uh, we imagine that maybe some people won't be available at those dates, then of course, we wait until uh, the fall now, uh, after this summer, to uh, send uh, all the performers to come back with uh, confirmation that they are available and welcome at those dates. And for the one who already had signed up for other things and won't be able to come, of course, we will find other wonderful musicians to take over. Uh, just for for us to understand uh, about the I mean amount of people, can you give us some numbers? How many uh, um, performances, lectures, and other things uh, are planned? Yes, well, uh, usually we get over two hundred uh, harpists who are coming to lecture or perform, or uh, and this is not counting the non harpist musicians and this is not coming counting because they will be for of course uh they were planned a lot of uh, ensemble harp ensembles also with uh, students or with young children and uh there were supposed to be a lot of them so and this is not counting including all of them because then we would go much over 300 400 maybe and uh, what else is what else is happening besides the lectures and uh, the concerts of the harpists? Well, you know that when, when I used to speak about the World Harp Congress, um, I see it in many different ways. Uh, first of all, it's an amazing way to learn about our instrument because most of us we play the lever harp or the pedal harp, we play jazz or we play classical or we play very contemporary music, but we are more or less in the little uh, window and we are, are doing this and we know about this. Um, but when you go to a Congress, uh, World Harp Congress, you, you can see any, all types of harps you can find in the world, you will find at the World Harp Congress. So it's opening so many um, to so many different ideas, to so many uh, different ways. And, and I'm sure, especially for the very young generation, you know, the teenagers, the early 20s, uh, students coming out and, and wondering, okay, I'm a harpist now, what am I going to do? What am I going to play or find out? And then you see all, I mean, people have so much imagination. Uh, the harp, is for me one of the most amazing instruments because uh, there are so many different ways to play it. Small ensembles, big ensembles, uh, electric, non-electric. Uh, so it's just, I think the only limit with the harp is the imagination of the harpists themselves. And uh, so in a World Harp Congress, you, you see all that. And maybe be, because you are going to see that, this will give you an idea of something totally different but this will be the little seed that will be planted to give you other ideas. And on top of that, you get in just a few days time to hear life and to meet the best harpies and performers our time and to make the best friends also. Because as I said earlier, harpies are amazing people. And, uh, and, and the, the friendship, the, the support you find in our community is just incredible. And when you get to a Hop, uh, World Hop Congress, you get to meet so many people. And then you keep those links through the years. And then we all need 
to rely on each other because we know how it's difficult with our instruments when we have to play by the other part of the world. And now everything is so complicated to, to, to send an instrument anywhere. So, you know, when you make so many friends over, overall in the world, then you, you keep in touch and then one day you are going to perform in that area, then you have a friend there and you have a friend who is going to help you get an instrument, find one, uh, and then you will do the same for the one coming in your area. So um, I just think it's just a wonderful place to be. No, this is this is very important uh, uh, topic. The, I mean, the network between the harpists is one of the most um, important part of our career because without it, we are we cannot uh, do so much. Because I I personally still think that even if we work so much, uh, the we our world is still based on the concept of harpist for the harpist. And uh, that what is the World Harp Congress about? Do you think that the World Harp Congress as the most, um, uh, I mean, it's most powerful organization, most powerful uh, happening in the hour in uh, harpist life, will it ever come to the point where it will be also the harpist to the rest of the world, to others? Well, that, that is, of course, what, what we hope. And uh, because, you know, when we have such a big window, and this is why every Harp Congress is working together with the major orchestra from the city or the major orchestras, uh, and uh, very often also with radios, with televisions, and uh, because it's a way to open on the world. But I think this is also every single harpist job to do that and um, there are a number of harpists who are really doing this wonderfully but most of us performing even the one of us with agents and signing up with great orchestras but we still work a lot through our colleagues because we are invited from our colleagues and we have so amazing harpists around the world organizing just like you, Sasha, festival, organizing competitions, putting people together. And this is also the way for opening to the others. But it is true, the harp is not the piano, is not the violin, is not the voice. So we probably much more than any other instrument, we need each other. And one thing I wanted also to say about the World Harp Congress and what is so wonderful is that we have so many wonderful people around the world making most beautiful instruments and they come for us they come for us they come to show us all the inventions they come because even still the harp has not changed that much since uh, Echar uh, made it 20 uh, 200 years ago but still they always come up with new ideas to make life for harpists easier and then we might meet a small a manufacturer that no so many people know about and then that one will fall in love with their instrument uh, and so all possibilities are there and uh, we should be thankful thankful to them also because without them a world hub congress couldn't exist so a, a world hub con congress couldn't exist without the harpist without the harp lovers and without the heart manufacturers. That's that's absolutely true. You know, uh, I was I was going to play on this World Hub Congress the Star Wars uh, and uh, Harry Potter with the transmission. And I was proposing that especially to bring more attention just for, for, by the reg, from the regular people so i i hope that it will um, it will work next year even better because people will be even more hungry for the for the music and uh, in, another thing which is uh, uh, which is exactly in between of now and 2021 august we don't still don't know how long we will stay 
in uh, this situation. So many people will do different things. So for example, I decided that I will concentrate on the arrangements, on online lessons, and on this uh, project, on the conversations, on the new platform, I'm just learning that, and we're doing through the new platforms like Patreon, where people can actually um, um, actually make subscribers which are helping them. So what, what you explored so far, and what are you going to do right now? Well, um... Actually, the, what I'm exploring most is teaching online uh, because um, I have been asked a few times to do either master classes or lessons online. And in my school uh, at the academy in Oslo, they were always talking a, a, a lot about how we could go digital more and more. And I was a bit skeptic, I have to say, uh, about how this would work because as a teacher, I think the contact with the student is very important. I I show a lot, and then I I I think the the fact that you feel how it's going in the hand, how it's going in the fingers. Uh, I I'm also very much uh, concerned about the posture. So I go around the student. I watch how they are uh, standing, sitting, and everything. So I was a bit uh, wondering how this could work. But like a lot of things in life, when you get a new tool, you have to use it as a new tool and not try to make it work with your other habits somehow. So I had to change my way of teaching in some ways uh, because the, the way I was using, if I'm in the same room as a student, would not work if I would do this digital. So actually I, I have developed different tools and I think that they work really well. And I'm not saying that one could teach a student from A to Z only digital, uh, but I think it's a, a very big plus to a, a more regular normal teaching. And I think this is something that I might keep doing afterwards because um, I'm learning a lot. I'm seeing actually when I teach things that I might not see when I'm teaching. Because when we teach a student, usually we sit on the side. Uh, when a teacher, uh, when we are now teaching online, we see different angles. Uh, we see closer also. And we can work on small details uh, really, really well. I'm also asking the students to send me a lot of videos. But I think, for example, I'm very much working on technique with my students because I think that without a good technique, we cannot be a good musician. We can be a good musician inside, but if the fingers don't respond, you will never be a good performer. So you have to first make your fingers strong to be able to make them do what you really want musically. So uh, it's a bit like a, a, a horse, you know, a wild horse. You have to tame it if you want it to win the race. So it's a bit with the same with your fingers. You know, they, if they are wild horses, then you will never win. Uh, you have to tame them. And to tame them, you have to exercise and you have to practice and work on technique. And actually, uh, on the digital uh, teaching, I think that it really works well for uh, working on technique. It's a bit more challenging, of course, if we want to uh, speak about sound, about this is why also I'm asking them to send videos because sometimes if the connection on internet is not very good, then it's even difficult sometimes to hear if the, the tempo is steady, if there is a pulse or not. And uh, of course, contrast with dynamics, we know when we make CDs, for example, that we always have to exaggerate the dynamics because when you record, uh, it's kind of um, uh, narrowing the, the range of dynamic. So, but there are a lot of things we can work on. And, um, and this time where my students also are just um, inside the house and cannot do much more. So I'm really, taking this opportunity to work even more on technique with them. And, uh, and I have to say that it works really well. 
what works very well also if even though i've always been telling them record yourself watch yourself listen to yourself be your own teacher but you know between what you say and what they feel they have the time to do because it takes time uh but now they have no choice so they have to do it and then it really helped them and and i've seen one of my students for example she has really bloomed from this period she has improved more in four weeks time than she has the three months before uh so i think they are really good tools and like every tool it's and the same as technique is not enough to have the tool is how do we use it in its best way and then i get the the time to read things that i never have time to read and to listen to music i never i always wanted to listen to and never had time to so yes so that's um sometimes it's nice to have a bit more time i i have the same feeling that the students are working now more concentrated and i'm also also asking much more from my students uh, to write everything down to be uh, much more precise but i think and uh, i would like your opinion on that that um when we teaching a uh, life just staying tete a tete with our students mostly most of the time we use our intu- intuition so we are intuitively uh, re- reflecting on the music on some nuances and trying to change that and now with online lessons as for the teachers we need to be more constructive and basing more on the theory than on uh, our ears because we cannot also hear every small details through skype or whatever service we need so do you do you agree with that that now actually for the teachers it's need to go a little bit back to the papers and prepare prepare the materials to teach the methods the everything bring these books back yes yes that's that, that is true what it's giving the most i think of this digital way of teaching the students not to be with them I think that they need to be more in charge of themselves much more uh than when they know they come to the lesson every week and then they rely much more on their teacher I think and for example for me when I have my student to send me videos what I want them to do is to make their own comments about their own play and so I watch their videos and after that i read their comments so some of them come with really exactly the same comments i would have made and sometimes i pay attention on thing they didn't pay attention to then i get back to them and i said okay your comments are very good but have you thought about this and what about that so i try to challenge them a bit more and make them look di- to different things because um i don't know if you experience the same but i see that students sometimes tend to comment on small details oh yes i i i forgot a pedal here or i had a bird there or but then they sometimes forget to see the whole picture uh how was the whole picture how was convincing did i look tense did i look happy uh how was the general pulse how was the general feeling of the piece and and i think that's very important that they learn also to reflect on those things on those things because those things are the one that are reaching the audience the audience doesn't care about the little wrong pedal or the buzz we need to work on those when we practice of course because they should be only accidents but if they come as an accident they are not important they are bad only if we learn them that way but not if we accidentally make a mistake but uh, don't, don't you think that um it's um basically the lack of the self critic and the lack of um examples so the uh, students are not uh trying to get somewhere do you think it's it's kind of issue um 
I don't know. I don't know about self-critic. I think sometimes students have too much of self-critic or maybe not oriented the best way. Uh, and um, and I, I, I tend to tell them that they should comment their own play the way they would comment someone else play. Because uh, if you have a classmate or a friend playing for you, you are never going to, to say, oh, you are so bad. You are not able to play that like that. Oh, so stupid of you. But that's the way we speak to ourselves most of the time when we are not happy with our play. So, um, and I think it's very important to learn to be aware of the good things we do as well as the one that we think could be better and then try to find solutions. Okay, this is where I'm very strong and really good at. These are weaknesses. How can I make those weaknesses stronger and become things I am also will be proud of? Knowing that all of us, we have weaknesses because we are human beings. Not everyone is exactly the same. Some people are uh, problems with the liver or some of the uh, problem with the foot or an arm. Or, okay, as a musician, that's the same. We all have things where we are really strong and others where we are less strong. And we have to accept it, not meaning that we don't want to be better on those things, but we have to accept not to be perfect. And the problem is most of us, we want to be perfect when perfection doesn't exist. So it's just to, how do we reach to our audience? How do we touch people? I think that's what is really important. But once again, we need to have good fingers to be able to do that. So um, yes, I think the, the, the judgment students put on themselves is sometimes what is um, refraining them from going really further. Well, we we don't know when we will get to the audiences in the ne next time. Actually, I wanted to ask you in the uh, end of May, is it still fixed your um, uh, your academy in uh, Oslo? Uh, you mean in August? Not in uh, May. It's not May? No, no, no. At the moment, we, we still have a summer academy in Oslo, which is mm -hmm. in, uh, in the, uh, from the 10th to the 15th of uh, August. And at the moment, the, it's still planned to, to happen. But of course, uh, we live a bit week by week uh, how things will be, because it's not only about Norway, because there are a lot of international students coming to this academy. So how will they be able to fly to Norway? Will Norway, you know, it's in Europe now, most countries have uh, closed their borders. So how will those borders open again? So it's, um, it's a bit difficult to plan so, so, so long ahead at the moment. Yes. Yeah, it's it's a difficult question, but so we have quite a lot of time. And recently, you was giving the interview uh, about uh, how basically to solve your time, how to make plans, uh, how to make uh, uh, in the same time the schedule and the diary, so you reflect uh, on what you planned, what you do, and so on, so on. But uh, you were telling there a very important thing that now when we feel that there is a lot of time, we are not able to use it constructive. So we, most of the people are now, especially the artists are now procrastinating. So they think like, okay, now I have more time. So I will do the things that and that too many things I wanted to do so many and uh, there is difficult. So what would be, your recommendation how to get rid of all these opportunities and how actually to concentrate on what you need and how to know what you need <laughs> well I, I i think um one way might be to already write a list you know what in english they call a bucket list so of all the things you want to do or always have wanted to or maybe things that you never thought about before and now feel the need or the urge to do. So write a list and then 
decide about yourself. Okay, how many of those do I want to have achieved when we go out at, again? And when we won't have that much time we have had until now. So, or in one week time, which one of those ones when I want to? So may, maybe some points in that list will, can be done in one day or two days. Maybe some can be done in one week. Maybe some will take life to achieve. But where do I start and how do I start? And I, I, I was telling my students also that um, sometimes when we have so much time and then we think, oh, I, yes, I'm going to practice and practice and practice. And then we forget that we need to rest also because the brain needs to rest, the body needs to rest. So I think it's also important, even if we have the feeling that every day is following another one and looking exactly the same, we should maybe keep to try to have a, a, a week with five working days and a weekend or maybe five and a half or six working days and one day off. Because I think it's very important to have that moment where the body resets a little bit the energy and to start fresh again. Because at some point, the brain doesn't take more and then we get frustrated and we start to feeling that, oh, but my practice is getting worse and worse and worse. And it's just because we need some oxygen, we need some fresh air. So um, I think that is also very important. I, I, I said to my students, if you practice, for example, five hours every day, seven days of the week, then it's much better to practice six hours, six days of the week, and then have a whole day rest. Because in one day, if you practice five or six hours, it won't make such a difference on how you will be tired at the, end, at the end of the day. But to have one full day off, one, one day in a week will make a big difference. So, and then use that day to do things that even you are inside at home and feel you have all time, but you never have the time to do. I don't know if you have children, bake with them, or if you have uh, yourself just read books or watch a movie or, you know, do something that um, you don't feel the time you have to do otherwise, even though you are at home with a lot of time. Well, it's, it's good. Um, it's good when we speak about the people who have basically one thing to do or practice or not to practice. But like speaking about you, you are the teacher, the organizer, uh, you are, are. You was working in the orchestras. You was. Uh, you have amazing solo career. You have uh, a lot of CDs and so on, so on. So that means that during one day, just one day, you was not only practicing the harp, but doing thousands of different things. And I think now it's a problem because just to schedule six hours uh, of practicing is okay. Well, you do two, 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 and then you, the rest of the day, you are chilling. Okay. But if you want, like most of the modern people want to achieve a lot, how you concentrate on that, on different things, how you change from one to another? Well, the thing is, what does it mean to do a lot? You know, because uh, in life you have quality and you have quantity. So, of course, if you have the quality and the quantity, it's good. But sometimes people have the quantity, but do they have the quality? So, um, the thing is, what you want. For example, if you are at a stage where you are able to make CDs, to make recordings, uh, and now there are a lot of things that are going to happen also directly on the net. So try to think about different programs, different things. How could I make something really interesting? Uh, which kind of program would I like to work on? Um, do I have a favorite style, a favorite period I really want to work on? Let's say uh, the first half of the 19th century or the second half of the 18th century. And then ding, dig into that period and try to find, you know, because now you have a lot of time, you are at home. And I was thinking at some point, okay, this is a very 
terrible situation for a lot of people who are missing their jobs and everything. But we are somehow lucky that it's happening now and not 20 years ago. Because what would have people done 20 years ago or 30 years ago when internet was just Oops. kidding? Yes, you know, and, and where it was so difficult, it would have been so difficult to hold contact with your family, with your friends, with your community. So at least on that side, we are very lucky. So, and, and I'm a, I'm kind of person, and that probably came from the education of my mother, but always looking at the glass half full and never half empty. So, okay, we are in this situation. There is nothing we can do about it. How could I come out of it for the best? How can I grow? How can I learn from that situation? How can I come out of it as a better person as a better musician what can i do to make this happen because i'm i'm the only one in charge of myself so what do i want re really where do i want to go and it's on, not enough like if you all of a sudden you are deciding you want to climb the himalaya okay that's a very good uh, goal but that's not enough to have the goal you need to decide okay which path should i take and how do I need to equip myself? What do I need to buy? Which people do I need to go with? What should I do? So there are a lot of milestones and uh, in between the moment you decide you want to do this and the moment you reach it. So it's a little bit the same here in this situation. We are in such a situation where, first of all, we need to learn how to live the moment because so many of us, we are always into what's going to happen next. Yes, it is good to anticipate a bit about what is going to be life again when it will come back to normal. But because we don't know at the moment how the life will go back to normal and when, we need also to be in the moment. Okay, today, what can I do to make this day today best possible? And then the same tomorrow. And then how do I make my day to today being able to take me to that place, to that goal where I want to go. How do I give myself the tools to get there? So I, once again, it's just to go back. I, I believe a lot in writing things because I think it helps a lot because sometimes we just get so many ideas and they just pin a bit, uh, a bit in, the, in the head. So when we write down things, we see right away expectations that can become reality an expectation that just will be only dreams. And it's nice to dream, but if we dream too much, then we get disappointed. So we have to have goals that we can reach because that's how we will just give ourselves that good feeling that will take us even further. So writing down a list and how do I get to where I want to be? To go and and maybe in, to start with even if your list is very long is not to put too much uh in your own expectation because if you don't reach what you want you are frustrated i think it's always better to start slower and reach what you want to reach be really happy congratulate yourself and think oh yes but then i can go even further and do something more um, instead of being, oh, I wanted to do this, I was not able to do it, and then I'm frustrated. So to think positive is so important. That's what takes us where we want to go. Yes, it's it's really difficult to choose to choose between the possibilities. And um, well, as uh, as I know, uh, you was studying with uh, a lot of different teachers, and among them are. Uh, Susan McDonald and uh, Madame Benoit, uh, Fontana, yes. sorry, yes. Fontana Benoit. yes, and uh, um, so you got a lot of different, uh, different influences and a lot of different schools. So now I think uh, a lot of teachers giving their online lessons because, well, everybody sits at home. Would you would you recommend to the students to try? 
actually get out now to have this possibility to study with different teachers and how to choose? I mean, how to choose now? Well, so I'm just going to say this. First of all, it depends on the level of the student. I think uh, two young students studying with different teachers, especially if they have different methods, can be a little bit uh, complicated and uh, put them in a situation where they can be a bit lost. But when you get to a certain level where you are able to um, get what you want from a teacher, uh, I really see schools as being a good beginning because we need a school to begin with. But at some point, I see also limits in schools because a lot of schools, and I'm not speaking only about the harp here, I'm speaking much more generally, but schools are for me too closed up. And, uh, and then I think so many schools have so many good things. If we, I, I'm going to take another subject, but it's a little bit like politics. You know, for me, I don't think in politics, one knows everything and the others are just bad. I think if we would have a, a politic where we learn from each other, you know, and we have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and just get the best of everyone, that would be ideal. And I think that for schools, it's the same because some schools are really good for specific music when others will be better for other type of music. So what it is, because what it is for us, a school as harpies, we more or less speak about articulation because this is in what more or less schools can have different visions, you know. Can you describe in the, mid in the middle what is about the, uh, the schools, which schools you are talking about? Just a little bit, maybe two, three. Okay. Yes, like for example, uh, small articulation. Uh, the, the Tournier school, for example, was essentially on the large strong articulation of the wrist, of the fingers and everything. Uh, when you had the Renier, Renier was much more specific, also speaking about the small articulation. Uh, the Salzedo school is much more about the small articulation than about the big, large articulation or the wrist articulation like in the Tournier school. So, but I think all those are very important. We should be able to have the Tournier school and the Salzedo school and the Renier school and the Russian schools all together, depending what we play. For me, those schools are a bunch of baskets with tools. But I think all those baskets should be together in one larger bas basket where we, should, we could choose only which tool we need for whatever we play. If we play forêt, we are not going to say you to use the same tools as if we play Bach or if we play Paris Chalvars or uh, so you know what tool is the music asking for but when you look at pianists do they play and do they have the same way of playing if they play Liszt or if they play Haydn of course not so um, I think it's not for me what I, where I see the limit is in, in a school is the feeling I have uh, is that the message they send is, okay, one school fits all. Like if you go in the store and buy a t-shirt and one size fits all. But for me, no. For me, it's uh, music is not one fits all. It's just, you have to have it as a creator, you know, it's just, uh, tailored made and uh, depending of which kind of music you are going to play outfit you are going to wear you're not going to tailor it the same way so for me that's my own vision so it can be very interesting for students of a higher level if they know that their teacher is teaching a specific school it can be very interesting for them to go to another teacher with another school just to open their eyes just to think, oh yes, but there is also this possibility. Let's see, let's experience. If I do this with this kind of school, which result do I get? 
And if I do this with this kind of score, which result do I get? What sounds best? What is serving best the composer and the type of music I'm playing? And, uh, and I think that is what can be very interesting. But for that, you need to have students already of a certain level who are able to make uh, those differences and to take them uh, inside them. Can we go deeper a bit of this? Because I think everybody has now the, the question and uh, we cannot talk about all the teachers, but how to know, how to know which teacher represents which school, because it's, it's difficult to see. So maybe, maybe we can just discuss some of the names, like yes. who, who are now presenting this kind of schools with these old schools? Well, uh, if you want to go to Salzedo, for example, one of the, at the moment, um, the most uh, famous harpist playing the Salzedo, of course, you have Judy Lohman, but even Judy Lohman, you know, uh, in Canada, she, she has moved a little bit away. She's not a fully Salzedo technique because she used also a bit. But Yolanda Condonasis, for example, in America, Alice Giles in Australia, those are very famous representatives of the Salvedo school. So, um, but of course, there are a lot in America of teachers coming from Salvedo school. So, and I think that maybe a student should ask their own teacher, you know, in, in the area, they might know more about the local unless they want to go to people on the other side of the world. But if they want to work with local people or from their own country, their teachers might be able to tell them who is coming from which school. And even in America, if you had been there, like, of course, 50 years ago, but even 20 years ago, I think there was a, a huge difference between Salzedo school and Granjani school. But I think our days, those differences tend to uh, be much less than they used to be. The same in France, you know, before you had the Tony school and then the Jamais school. But I think also with those schools, they tend to be much less, at least for people of my generation now. Um, I don't think harpies of our generation see so much ourselves like coming from one school specifically, because all of us, we have worked so much towards what is working so well for our instrument and for what we are playing. For, for, for me, for example, if I may speak about my own experience, coming from the Tony school, I didn't have so much of an experience of the small articulation on the harp. But when I had to record my, my Guardia CD and I had to do it on a single action harp, so it was a copy of a Cousineau harp, and I had two weeks only to work on that harp, including the recording. But in, in, in a one day, I had to change my whole technique because the tournier technique just couldn't work on that instrument. It was just impossible. So I had to find the way to make my technique work on that harp. And this is how I found what is the small articulation. I had a teacher teaching me that small articulation before I would have maybe saved a bit of time. But I think also that ourselves, when we get to a certain point, our best school is our ears. Because the ears will tell us if this is right or not. So it's just to try, you know, play something, listen, how does it sound? Is that the way? It should sound and you want it to sound, 
or not. If not, then try something else. And I'm sure a lot of the people listening to us tonight will hear that themselves and they will find their own way of playing that is actually going to serve the music in the best way. From my own experience, I would I could say that I started with Tabel School, which is Russian one. And uh, that was my teacher was uh, teaching me in St. Petersburg. Then I went to Moscow and uh, uh, I was taking the workshops from the teachers there. And the school was already slightly different. It was Lipushkin and Dulava, and it was a little bit different uh, thing. Uh, even if it's mixing, as you say, with Tabel school. But then I, then I came to Europe and I met uh, Catherine Michel, and she was uh, teaching me Pierre Jamais school, which comes from Aselma. And uh, it's um, she is very she is very strict about that about the articulation and everything. Uh, and but then I met, um, for example, um, Marielle Nordman, and she's Lila Skin student, and uh, she is she has totally different way of thinking about the the articulation and everything and then of course i met susan mcdonald Jana boshkova and that was i mean a, a little bit different course and uh, when i came to united states and met nancy allen and, and uh, judy loman i saw also that uh, there is uh, uh, also completely different way but they are not using all these salsetta things, like they're not holding their hands above the harp, they still the, on the harp. So you are, I, I'm just saying all of that to say that actually you are totally right about the mixture of the schools in uh, professors, uh, professors now. But I would, I would, from my own experience, suggest that there is a still a three bases which are still can be very different. It's a uh, Russian school based on Sabel Slipushkin. Uh, then it's French school based uh, on, uh, well, many, many people from the past, uh, starting with Boxa and, and so on and so on. And there is the American school, which developed mostly even not uh, only because of the teachers, because there was uh, uh, Granjani and Salcedo mo uh, teaching the most, but also because of the instrument, because uh, uh, Lennon uh, Healy is the instrument which is much uh, easier to play for for my uh, opinion than the Soviet Union harp, this Lunacharsky, or uh, Salvi or Kamak. So uh, I think that this is the three main schools which we have right now. So do you um, do you think that? Uh, in this particular moment of the time when we are all staying like in a blockade. So uh, is it the uh, time to solve the things which were before? So like to realize uh, what you wanted to do or it's the time to build new things. So learn new schools, learn new people and so on. So what, what is, now, I think for you, the most important to solve the past or create the future. And, and why not do both? Maybe there is a way to, to do both some, somehow, uh, because I, I think that the past is very important. I mean, the heritage we have from all those great harpies from the past centuries uh, is very, very important. And we should not forget that. Uh, but maybe we want to build a future where there is less of those schools. And, and, and I think this is what is so nice now with uh, the generation, my generation and the, all the generations afterwards, is that the harpies are not fighting the way they used to do before. Uh, before uh, in America, you had 
Salzedo and Guarjani and the students of Salzedo and the students of Guarjani and the students of the students, etc. And they would almost not speak to each other. You know, uh, if there was a festival with this type of student, the other were not invited and the other way around. In France, it was also this, a bit the same. There was a lot of fights between the different schools. So, and, and, and I think this is now over. And I'm so happy about this because as, as when we started our discussion, we need so much each other. I, I, I think we are just losing energy fighting each other. So when we can be so much, so much stronger being together because we should never just forget that we play the same instrument. And, and when you go to play a concert, in the audience, who is caring about which school you are coming from? I mean, are they asking the question, oh, is she a Salzado? No, only harpies care about that. And, and usually when we perform, unless we play for a World Park Congress, I mean, how many harpies are there in the audience? And I think also this is making us weaker towards the big festivals you know, when they feel that harpies are coming and they are just fighting, oh yes, you, you know. So I think this is coming over and I think this is very good. And that's the thing that for me, this is where we need to think the future all together. And, and, and the moment, the situation we are in now, we just see all of us, we are in the same situation. Who cares about schools? I mean, you're in Russia, you're in America, you are in France, you are in other places. We are all in the same situation. And we are all going to come out of this together, not fighting each other. Mm -hmm. For me, that's where taking the past into future to make this something common for all of us. And if some people are happier with the Salzedo technique, and some people are happier with the Russian technique or the French technique. That's fine also. You know, it's like <clears throat> harp manufacturers. We have wonderful harp manufacturers. We have wonderful harps all over the world. So, but why is it a problem if some harpies feel more comfortable playing this type of harp and others play more comfortable playing this type of harp because we are different. We have a different body structure. We have a different finger. We, we, so it's, it doesn't mean that because we prefer to play that instrument, the others are not good. But that, this is just fitting ourselves better. And this is also maybe my dream now is that there would be less competition on that side also. That, okay, it doesn't matter once again, when we play, when we perform a concert, the audience is just caring that the performer is happy with the instrument they play because they will give the best. Who cares which brand it is as long as it's a good instrument. So yes, maybe that is my dream for going out after this quarantine we are all in and is that we open borders there also. The same as mine. That's that's wonderful. And I have a last last question. We were already talking for an hour. I have a last question, um, and it's uh, again about the World Harp Congress. But I think it's an important question. Will uh, uh, this um, rescheduling affect the future um, editions of the World Harp Congress? Well, you, you, you know that the, the next World Harp Congress is planned to be in St. Petersburg in Russia, right? So the normal dates was 2023. So at this point, uh, there has been no decision made whether it will still be in 2023 or if we postpone all the next Congresses one year after. So this is a decision that is going to be taken together with a lot of people. Of course, the board uh, of the World Harp Congress, also with the harp manufacturers, because as I said, they are so important. So will they be ready to come two years after or not? Or do they need three years? It will be very important to speak with the harpists in St. Petersburg who are going to organize the Congress. Because also we have to think that for a lot of people who come to a Congress, it's an economical investment you need to pay 
of course, uh, you need to pay for your travel, for your hotel, for everything. And it's kind of a, a budget for everyone. So maybe people won't be able to do that again two years after Cardiff. So this is a whole thing we need to discuss. We are going to ask a lot of people to make sure that we will take the best decision after that. Well, I think all of Russia will be waiting for that because that will be the first Congress uh, in uh, Russia yes. and the harp developing a lot. I mean, we got now the first harp center in Moscow. It never been the, there. So it's, yes. it is a development and it's very good that we get this possibility now. Yes. I'm very, very excited. I've been a uh, number of times to Russia, both Moscow and St. Petersburg and uh, the harp community there is amazing. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that also. Well, I'm looking forward as well. And thank you so much for this conversation. I think we learned a lot. Myself, I will keep doing the videos. I will, uh, I will make them uh, also available. And uh, I would just uh, suggest to our listeners to uh, subscribe for the uh, Patreon and for this website, because uh, and the Facebook, of course, it's open source platform, but uh, it's very difficult to work for big audiences. So I will be basically making the audiences smaller in order to make, as you say, the quality. So to make possible later to make conversations, the questions and everything. So you will hear the news from me. And uh, I hope that um, you stay in touch with Isabel. And uh, I don't know, are you are you providing the online lessons also for your, not uh, your students? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, okay. and so, one, I will be happy. Okay, so I also put the link on your uh, website. So if there is any questions, the people can contact you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you for doing this and all you do for the harp and the harp words. Thank you so much. Thank you. And talk to you soon.